Tonight. So, I first want to thank our, our panelists for being here. We really appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank the College of Business and, and the Center for Sport Management who worked together to build this uh, great event for us tonight. Uh, this is the type of collaboration that uh, is really important here at Drexel, and uh, with our partnership uh, with LeBeau and the Center for Sport Management, uh, we're looking forward to, to more events like this. Uh, this topic tonight, a conversation on race and sport, is part of the Pressure Point series. Pressure Points was developed on the desire to support a culture of inclusion that offers a safe haven for Drexel community and others uh, to share perspectives, conversations, and experiences. Tonight's program kickstarts a conversation on race that clearly resonates with the national dialogue. I thank you all for taking the time to be here uh, tonight to engage and to listen and to converse with one another in humble and uh, productive ways. Um, so enjoy. Uh, this should be great. Uh, I want to introduce Joel Maxey, who is the director of the Center for Sport Management, who will say a few words. So thank you. Thanks, Dean Jensen. Um, on the behalf of the Center for Sport Management, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. We're really delighted to co-host this uh, as part of the LeBeau's uh, Pressure Point series. Thanks to Brian Ellis, uh, Caitlin Mahan, and, and all of LeBeau. It's, it's a great pleasure to be, to be part of this and, 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 and on this team. I'd like to give a quick recognition to, uh, to our sport management team. Uh, professors Larry Cohen, maybe in the hallway, and Karen Weaver. There's Karen, uh, uh, providing great help, and our administrative staff, Billy Clement and, and Sarah Grogan. You may have seen handout programs, but again, they're a great help to our center and, and I think help us do the, the things that we're able to do, including an event like this. Um, special thanks to tonight's moderator, Dr. Ellen Starowski. She envisioned this program. She worked tirelessly to set up the speakers, uh, set up the promotion, all of the details. Uh, I think everybody knows Alan knows the hard work that she puts into things and makes events like this come off. I don't think any details have been overlooked here. Uh, thanks to the, to the panelists. Uh, this is a distinguished group of writers, educators, coaches, executives. Uh, and uh, Marcus Tatum is going to provide the detail of, uh, of each one of their backgrounds and his introductions. And with that, I want to say a few words about Marcus. Uh, Marcus is one of our sport management students. He's a, a senior at Drexel. He's going to graduate this June 2018 with a degree Bachelor of Science in Sport Management, a minor in Business Administration. I think all of us who have been his professors will attest that Marcus has been a top student since his arrival at Drexel. Besides academic success, and like most of uh, his Drexel classmates, uh, where experiential learning is, is really important, Marcus has accumulated some significant work experience. He's working with Christopher Gruber from Morgan Stanley on a sport development project. Currently, he's interned with the Philadelphia Union of Major League Soccer. He's been a field manager with the Little Pond Golf Center, volunteered with the U.S. Open Squash Championships we hosted Drexel. Uh, I can say this, Marcus has represented the center and Drexel University very well at every turn. So without further delay, I give you Marcus Tatum to introduce the panel. Dr. Maxey. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you guys uh, for coming out this evening uh, for this important discussion. I'm truly honored to even introduce these panelists and our moderator. So I'll start. Uh, our first uh, person on the panelist is Mr. Kevin Blackstone, who is a longtime national sports columnist now at the Washington Post, a panelist on ESPN's Around the Horn, a contributor to National Public Radio, and co author of The Gift for Ron, a memoir by former NFL star Everson Walt. He is also a professor in the Merrill School of Journalism at the University of Maryland. Mr. Blackstone has received several honors, including first and second place awards for sports column writing from Texas Associated Press, managing editors, Chicago Newspaper Guild Award for investigative reporting, and the National Association of Black Journalists Award for enterprise reporting. He was also a member of the team that won Texas Associated Press Managing Editors Award and has been a finalist several times for a press club Dallas Katie Award. Thank you, Mr. Lacks, for being here. Our uh, next panelist is uh, Mr. Patrick Ruby. Uh, he's an award-winning writer, editor, and journalist. He's a fellow at the University of Texas 
and a former adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Mr. Ruby's work has appeared in the Washington Post, Washingtonian, ESPN the Magazine, the Washington Times, US Today, ESPN.com, The Atlantic Online, Sports on Earth, Esquire Online, Politico Magazine Online, The Post Game, The New York Times, ESPNW, Business Insider, and the UK Guardian Online. Six of his features have been selected for the Best American Sports Writing Anthology, and he is the win winner of the Associated Press Sports Editors Explanatory Writing Award. Thank you, Mr. Ruby, for being here. The next on the panel is uh, Mr. Zach Spider. He's in his second year of head coach of uh, Drexel University men's basketball team. Uh, Spider came to the Dragons from Army West Point, where he spent seven seasons as head coach uh, of the Black Knights. The winner of the 2013 Patriot League Coach of the Year Award. He was also named a finalist for the 2013 Skip Prosser Man of the Year and the Hugh Durham Award. Presented annually to the nation's top mid-major coach. He was one of only seven coaches in the country to receive at least one vote for the Associated Press National Coach of the Year honor that season. In 2016, Coach Spiker received a Prosser Man of the Year Award. Thank you, Mr. Spiker, for being here. And our moderator this evening is Dr. Ellen Starowski. She's a professor in the Center of Sport Management here at Drexel, and she's internationally recognized and an expert on social justice issues in sport. She is co-author of College of Athletes for Hire, The Evolution and Legacy of the NCAA Amateur Myth, and editor of the book Women and Sport, Continuing the Journey of Liberation and Celebration. She is currently a contributing writer for Sports Litigation Alert and Legal Issues in College Athletics, Dr. Ellen Starowski. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm already messing up the program because I was supposed to sit down, but then I realized that I couldn't see all of you. Um, so I'm going to uh, stand from here um, and do my moderating uh, from here. There are so many thank yous that need to be sent out, um, most particularly to our panelists, one of whom I apparently have lost. Professor Maxie was so kind in saying that I'm detail oriented, I've apparently lost an entire panelist. Um, <laughs> Or, 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 or he, he is lost on, the, on, on I-95 right now. Um, so I know that I won't be here. I got a note from him this morning saying that he was on his way. So, um, um, so, anyway, so we're hoping that we see him. Um, but but um, my heart is filled um, because um, uh, the three gentlemen sitting here really have done this as a personal favor to me um, and as um, a matter of our, our dear friendship. Um, so I cannot thank you enough. Um, because I am the beneficiary, um, and to be able to share you with our community is something that means the world to me. So thank you so, so much, personally. Um, there are other people that, that um, I do need to acknowledge. Um, uh, Associate Dean Brian Ellis um, is um, just um, a joy and a delight. Um, when I walked into his office with this idea for the program, um, he opened the gates and said, run with it. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yeah. um, the entire team, um, the SMT center team, um, as well as the Lebeau team, have just been exceptional to work with in every possible respect. Um, and then I also have to say that we are so blessed in this community to have colleagues from around the city who are so supportive of this kind of program, programming. Um, my mentor, Dr. Michael Sachs, comes to every single program that I do, and I know that many of us in the room do, so thank you so much for that. Um, and my wonderful colleague, um, Dr. Taylor, as well. Um, uh, Stephanie Trice, Dr. Trice at St. Joseph's University, and I know we have St. Joseph's students in the room. I know that we have um, uh, uh, students from Farley Dickinson who have traveled down here, not just for the cheesesteaks, but also um, but, but also for um, this event. So thank you so, so much. Um, uh, this event is um, being live streamed tonight, and we've uh, generated so much interest in this that coast to coast across the country as we're talking, um, there will be um, other uh, universities from San Francisco, University of San Francisco, to Ohio University, to Ottermine, to Yukon, and beyond who are listening. Um, and I will say um, bonsoir to le monde, um, to our friends um, in Canada, 
um, from the uh, universities of Saskatchewan, Toronto, and Windsor who are also tuned in. Um, and by long last, I think my thank yous are done. Whew. Um, here we go. The purpose of this program, I think we need to lay this down. In July of 2016, Carmelo Anthony, standing alongside other NBA players, including Chris Paul, Dwayne Wade, and LeBron James, opened the ESPYs by imploring fellow athletes to speak to their own experiences and use the power of their platform to work for change. Anthony said that night, we cannot ignore the realities of the current state of America. A short year and a half later, his words ring as true today as when he first spoke them. The purpose of our conversation tonight is to take to heart the fact that there are racial fault lines that run through sport and the broader society. And if we are to lead, we must talk with and listen to each other, difficult as a conversation this may and most likely will be. With the help of our panelists, we hope to explore how the tensions around racial issues within sport are situated within the larger national dialogue, consider what these times require of sport, of, of sport leaders, and how we can learn from each other to forge a path forward. So with this as an overview, I'm going to um, start at the first question and direct it to Kevin and to Patrick. And I want to take this back to around this time last year when um, uh, Colin Kaepernick um, <coughs> was in me um, for the first time. And um, you know his, his quote was, um, um, his, his quote was um, that he was not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. And he went on to say that this is a larger issue that goes well beyond football. Um, and that as a matter of conscience, he needed to do that. Um, and um, we've had gestures like this um, over many, many years. And I was hoping, given the work that you two do, that you could talk about um, these athlete protest movements in context, in historical context, and how that might help us frame what's happening today. Um, so Kevin, I'm going to ask you to start, and then Patrick. Sure, thank you very much for inviting me. It's cool to be at Drexel. I never turn this away when I come off the 30th Street Station, so this is, uh, this is, this is cool. Um, uh, last year at this time, uh, when the conversation started around what Colin Kaepernick was doing, um, I decided to change the class that I teach uh, in the fall at the University of Maryland um, to reflect uh, all this excitement around Colin Kaepernick and, and the reaction to, to what he did. And uh, that's what I've done, that's what I'm teaching this, this semester, and I call the class um, Sports Protest and Media. And the reason I include media is because I'm a part of the media, I'm in a journalism uh, uh, school, um, and because the way that the media frames issues is critical to how we come to understand the issue or misunderstand the issue and how we come to know the people or persons who are at the center of the issue. So one thing I'm very interested in and have been all my life is, is history. Um, as a journalist, I'm, I consider myself a modern day historian, right? Um, but I have a lot of interest in, um, in, in history uh, that you think of um, in terms of years past. And so Colin Kaepernick to me is part of the lineage. <clears throat> this isn't new. Um, uh, even the title here from Tommy Smith to uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos to, um, to Colin Kaepernick um, is somewhat truncated when you think about the history of the involvement of the progeny of enslaved Africans in this country who were athletes and how they um, protested uh, with their sport um, as, a, as a platform. Um, the very first, uh, one of the names that always comes to my mind first off is a guy by the name of Fleetwood Walker. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Fleetwood Walker, but he was actually the first um, professional, uh, the first black player in, in professional baseball back in the 1800s. And at any rate, he was run out by Jim Crow, <clears throat> and uh, specifically by a guy named Cap Anson, who's a considered um, by Cooperstown as the greatest baseball figure of the, of the 19th century. And uh, uh, Fleetwood Walker was an educated man um, at Oberlin uh, College, Oberlin University. And uh, uh, 
one of the things that kind of affected him in his being run out of, of baseball was what he was going to do about it. And as a result, he became one of the progenitors of the um, repatriation movement uh, in this country for um, African Americans back to Africa. He wrote a 47-page pamphlet back in 1908, which predated Marcus Garvey's movement. Um, it was called uh, Our Home Column, and it was all about uh, the grievances he had against um, this country as a man of color and how he thought it would best, could best be remedied by leaving this country and, and going back to Africa. So I think of him, I think of, of Paul Robeson, uh, not too far away from here in New Jersey, um, who to me is, um, if you talk about athletes and, and uh, social justice, I don't think anyone has even come close to doing for social justice what um, Paul Robeson did in this country in the first half of the last century. Um, became such a danger to this country that he was uh, eventually blackballed and, and run out of the country and spent much of his latter years um, over in Europe. If you go to Berlin, um, uh, he was a hero in Berlin. There's a, a museum dedicated to, to Paul Rose. Um, uh, I think about <clears throat> I think about even Jackie Robinson, not Jackie Robinson, who we in the media have have um, fed to you over the years, uh, the docile um, baseball player who was able to turn the other cheek, uh, no matter how many insults were spat in his face. But I think of the Jackie Robinson in 1944, who, while in the Army in Texas, was, was um, uh, faced a court martial um, because he refused to give up his seat uh, under orders from a white officer um, who was confused at that time about laws in this country uh, as it re related to um, uh, uh, black people on, uh, on uh, military vehicles and, uh, and on some, some public vehicles. So, Colin Kaepernick is not new. Um, uh, he won't be the last. Um, there are there is over a hundred years worth of of history um, towards being an, an athlete, particularly a black athlete, and using your stage, your platform, as a means to protest for your for your people. I would just well, first of all. Thank you for having me here. It's really great to be here. Um, good discussion, good topic. I want to follow on your point about how there's a lineage here. Because there's not, there's not just a lineage in terms of athletes protesting and speaking out about social injustice. There's also a lineage, and it's pretty consistent, about how American society has reacted to these protests. And there's a pattern there, too. Again, what Colin Kaepernick has gone through, and I'm sure some of you have seen this, recently filed a collusion suit against the NFL, but the amount of backlash and pushback that his actions generated and that the actions of others who have followed him generated, that's also not new at all. That goes back to the beginning uh, of this country as well. It goes back to the beginning of sports in this country as well. Um, but even more, even more recently, I, I won't go all the way back to the start of the last century, but to pick up with Tommy Smith and John Collins back there, they were not lionized in their time the way they are now. Like a lot of things to do with civil rights in this country, equal treatment under the law, basically not being as racist as we've been. It's always one of these things where the people who put their necks out on the line, who stood for what was right, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, it's always the case that people look back and say, these people were heroes, they did the right thing. Oh, I would have marched with them too. <clears throat> that is definitely not the story of American history. When you go back and look at the times, these people are always very unpopular. And they always catch tremendous backlash, and they always pay a high price for their activism and for standing up and for standing out. Um, I mean, they're, they're protesting the status quo generally, and that's usually what happens when you do that. Uh, Smith and Carlos, they didn't come home to a hero's welcome. Like, it, it affected them for the rest of their lives. I'm sure, I'm sure you could elaborate a little more on that. Um, but it was not a case where America immediately started building statues for them. Uh, if you look at other ath athlete activism in the 1970s, um, this is a little bit, one of my areas of interest is the NCAA. Um, in the early 70s, in the mid-70s, you saw the NCAA change one of its rules 
They used to give out, allow athletes to have four-year scholarships. They changed it to one-year scholarships. One of the reasons for that was to have a hammer for the coaches and the athletic departments over black athletes who were starting to speak up and speak out for their rights. Uh, a lot of them were inspired by Harry Edwards at San Jose State, who actually had some very successful campus-wide protest movements <coughs> with specific demands of the administration to integrate the campus more, to stop putting black students and black athletes you know, in essentially like fifth-rate like destitution-level dorms and shutting them out from certain programs on campus, uh, to hire more black faculty, things like that. You know, when people saw what Harry Edwards was doing, what he was accomplishing, there was a lot of backlash. Governor Ronald Reagan of California uh, was insulting him by name. And actually, they got to a war of words with Harry Edwards. Again, we all look at Harry Edwards as this like towering, heroic figure now. He was not seen that way by much of America at the time that he was doing this. Uh, you fast forward a little bit, you go back to the 1990s. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with a guy named Craig Hodges who played in the NBA. Uh, he didn't want to go visit the White House uh, for sort of political and social reasons. When the Chicago Bulls went to the White House and won the championship, he was basically blackballed from the NBA for that. Uh, Mohamed Abdul Roof, uh, another really great scorer in the NBA, uh, turned his back on the American flag during the anthem. Um, again, I think uh, social justice issues. I think I think he was some of the, was it Desert Storm too. Some of the American policy in the Middle East, it wasn't just racial, it was other things he had an issue with in American policy. He was also basically blackballed from the NBA. So it's not even that long ago that you can see this happening, you see the same kind of reactions. And one other thing I'll say in terms of the kind of pushback you see is you don't just see pushback to the specific issues that athletes are raising, you also see pushback to the idea of raising them in the context of sports. Almost a, how dare you do this during my sports game, during my entertainment. I'm not here for your protest. I'm here to watch football, basketball, baseball, whatever it is. In this case, I'm here to see you know, the military be honored during the flag and feel patriotic during the anthem. How dare you interrupt this with a criticism of America? And something that has nothing to do with sports, or technically, or supposedly, nothing to do with sports. Um, <clears throat> People have always liked to use sports to escape in our society. And they like to sort of treat sports as if literally there's a sports page, like in the real world, where it's separate from everything else in the newspaper. But you can't really wall it off, obviously, in the real world. Sports exists in society. It's part of the economy. It's part of our culture. It's part of our politics. And I think that one of the ways that you see people not just push back, but sort of try to marginalize and quiet the sort of dissent in sports is to say, well, because you're using sports as a platform, it's not legitimate. Uh, and some of that is probably a fear of the fact that sports is actually a terrific platform, those kind of protests, because it gets so much more attention. And people who maybe don't pay attention to public policy, who don't pay attention to elections, don't pay attention to all the nitty gritty of democracy, they do watch sports. And if it's a successful protest, and I would argue that Kaepernick's protest has been incredibly successful in many ways, it gets those people thinking about these larger issues, and people who would like to just stay in that bubble of cocoon of sports, it pulls them out of it. Even if at first it makes them irate or, or forces pushback, a lot of times at some level it draws them out and teaches them something. And that's why I think like over time, you see attitudes shift. That's why now we all look back and say, those guys in Mexico City were heroes, even though at the time they did it, they were seen as villains. Thank you for that, that opening for us. Um, I want to direct this question to all three of you as a follow-up to the opening comments. Um, one of the things that strikes me about these protests is how very quiet they are. Like, if you think for a minute of, about this taking a knee, that's, that's a very quiet thing to do. And frankly, if, if you grew up in the Catholic tradition, it's also a very reverent thing to do, actually. But it's a very quiet thing to do. Um, the Northwestern football players a couple of years ago 
sign union cards in an attempt to uh, gain, uh, exercise their rights in terms of collective bargaining. And prior to that, about two dozen athletes around the country, football players, uh, attempted to do um, a, a protest called the um, All Players United protest. And um, on their wristbands or on their shoes, they would have three letters, APU. And, that, and that's all it was. That's all it was. It was very quiet. So I just want to get your reaction. What do you think is going on there? That, 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 that the gestures are actually raising a fist, genuflecting, very quiet. I might wear a t-shirt that says I can't breathe. What, what is it about those quiet gestures as opposed to taking to the streets um, uh, burning flags, um, other ways of protesting. Th th is, do you have any reaction to that in terms of what's going on there? I mean, I think that there's probably at least two things going on. Like, first of all, just because a protest or a gesture is quiet doesn't mean it lacks power. In fact, sometimes a quiet, understated protest can have more power. I mean, that image, again, the image of Smith and Carlos, that's more powerful than if either one of them had grabbed a microphone and delivered a speech. You know, it's the old cliche, it's meant to picture so the power of words. The image of Colin Kaepernick kneeling can be much more powerful than the detailed explanation that he gave after those games in the locker room. He's asked about why are you doing this? You know, in so many you know, sports, especially now, it's a televised visual medium. We live in a visual culture. So I do think that there's an element of wearing a t-shirt, or in this case, a hashtag, because we live in sort of social media culture as well. That, that has a power to it that sometimes, you know, giving a, like a, giving a rousing speech or doing a more aggressive sort of style of protest lacks. Um, I think there's also an element of, you know, people in sports in general, they're not necessarily trying to lead or drive conversations in an aggressive way. They, when they say they're trying to raise awareness, I take them at their word. They're actually trying to get people just to start conversing, to start thinking about things. They're trying to plant those seeds. Um, because, you know, again, they're not always, again, athletes do, you know, they're not always the final or best experts on some of these issues. You know, they, they're not always going to articulate every part of, you know, the problem with the public policy or something that needs to change perfectly. They're, they themselves are plugging into the larger issue and the larger network of people that are already, in most cases, dealing with this and working on it. So I think a lot for, for a lot of athletes, this is their way of being a part of something, not necessarily causing or being something on their own. What do you think of it? Um, <clears throat> I've actually been a little bit dismayed by the, by the silence of the protests. Um, I was at first taken by Colin Kaepernick's act. And it's interesting because, you know, had Steve Weish, um, longtime reporter, friend of mine, um, now with the NFL Network, not one noticed that Colin Kaepernick was not standing with his teammates as is customary during the national anthem. And secondly, not approached him and asked him what was going on. You know, chances are we certainly wouldn't have known, wouldn't have, wouldn't have found out when we did, and who knows if we ever would have. I mean, I assume that someone <coughs> would have. Um, and then secondly, um, Colin Kaepernick altered his silent protest from sitting to a knee in reaction to criticism that he was in some way offending the military, which to me was unfortunate because it gave credence to the criticism or the idea that the national anthem and the flag is somehow the personal purview of those who have served in the military. Um, <clears throat> and then, over a course of time, I think that Colin Kaepernick's silence 
has um, created a void in which others can enter and change the narrative of the protests to what they want. And I think we saw that most dramatically um, after uh, Donald Trump in Alabama had a political rally for um, one ultra-conservative against another ultra-conservative, um, foghorned his base by calling out, by challenging um, uh, owners in the NFL to discipline um, players, almost all of whom are black, uh, for using the flag and the anthem to protest. So uh, s strategically, I'm not so certain this time that silence was the best method of protest, um, especially when it's a protest that was born out of the Black Lives Matter movement, which has nothing to do with being silent and has everything to do with being confrontational. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just on a point, I mean, I, just to follow on what you were saying, one thing you definitely saw with the backlash to this, and then the politicalization of it, in particular by Donald Trump, was taking something that was about racial justice or injustice and turning it into an issue of racial resentment, which has a long, undistinguished history in American politics, as I'm sure you're all aware of, um, and in American culture. Uh, Many people have made an argument that I find pretty persuasive that much of why Donald Trump uh, was elected was on the basis of successfully exploiting racial resentment. Um, and obviously in our sports, uh, there's a long sort of undercurrent and I guess overcurrent of racial resentment and how that plays out in terms of fandom, how it plays out in terms of how we sort of frame and process the issues we see in sports, whether we're talking about social protests or just talking about stuff that happens on the field even. I mean, you don't have to go back very far uh, in the history of football, for instance, to see people saying, yeah, black athletes can't play quarterback. They're not smart enough. Or, I mean, just, just terrible. You know, we were talking about this before class. I, uh, I'm from George, at Georgetown, more professor, alumni there. Patrick Ewing is back there coaching now. and We're working on a story about him uh, I had to go back and sort of research the sort of horrible racial stuff he experienced as a player at Georgetown, even in high school. People were throwing bananas on the floor at him. They were holding up signs saying he can't read. Uh, when he was in high school, people were throwing rocks at his team bus, uh, chanting the N-word, all sorts of terrible stuff. This is like in the early 1980s. It's not that, not that long ago. And that was all taking place in, a, in an era of school desegregation in Boston, where he was from. Uh, and in Washington, D.C., obviously, is an incredibly racially bifurcated, if not segregated, city, especially in the 1980s. Um, so these tensions were playing out. And I do think that when it comes to this kind of protest, and also when it comes to the kind of backlash you see against it, uh, it's, it's just going to reflect what we see in society as a whole. It's always going to reflect that. Sports are always going to be a mirror of what's going on on a bigger scale. And it was weird. to see Trump inject himself into it was sort of like the Kool-Aid man bursting through the mirror and just being like, yes, this is what it's really about. Um, Zach, I'd like to um, pull you into the, the discussion. And um, um, want to give you time if you have any thoughts on reflection on any of this. But then I'd also like to layer on. Um, uh, two things, um, you know, with your experience having worked at um, uh, uh, the military academy, um, you know, having had that experience, um, you know, how does that lens affect the, the, sort of your experience of these things? And then also um, working with players on the ground and knowing that, and, and not not just here, but but across the sport landscape, we have um, we have. Um, teams and locker rooms that are very delicate um, ecosystems, right? And how, how, um, how as a, a coach, how do you um, work through the complications of communicating on these issues um, with your players, with your staff, with fans, um, 
So uh, any direction you want to take that. Sure. Uh, I would first say this is a tremendous honor. And uh, having uh, taken your class 20 years ago at Ithaca College when you showed up a week ago and wanted to see me, I was concerned that I didn't have a proper work site. <laughs> <in my mind. laughs> I got a little nervous. <laughs> seriousness it's an honor to be here and I think that uh, our role as coaches and our entire coaching staff is here um, members of our basketball program are here um, we've got a responsibility uh, to not bury our heads in the sand and worry about ball screen defense and whether we're rebounding or taking care of transition defense if the guy graduates and goes through our program in four years and he's a better basketball shooter or, or does things athletically better but we haven't opened these doors and, and allowed them to think and talk and discuss about these issues. I think we've failed as leaders, as coaches. And I feel very fortunate that we've got a great staff that we can have these conversations. And it always, they always can't be, hey, let's sit and talk about this issue. It's got to be organic. It's got to be authentic. And maybe it's at UPROS or maybe it's uh, at Urban having lunch or whatever it may be. And maybe it's not everybody at the same time. We all, most people in, in, in our world, have read the Carol Dweck book, right? And a lot of this, in my opinion, might be people that have a fixed mindset that aren't willing to listen to the other side of scenarios and what's going on, as opposed to people who have a growth mindset that are open to see what our country can become and open to see what we're about. And so maybe we have fixed mindset people who are stubborn and they believe what they're going to believe, and other people have a growth mindset. Hey, let's. Let's try and understand. My observation, I shared this with you last week, is it's disappointing and frustrating that we don't listen as passionately as we want to speak and promote what our own view is. If we did that, I think we'd all be in a way better spot. Would anything be resolved? I don't know, but maybe we could be a little bit more respectful of how we're going about it and see other sides. We have three things in our program. I'm not promoting how we're doing things, but it's important to understand. We talk a lot about gratitude, respect, and compete. And part of respect is we respect the process to be a good basketball team. We have to do certain drills and go about things a certain way, right? For the Sixers fans, it's very close to trust the process, but not quite, <laughs> right? But we gotta do our part. The, the other part is we gotta respect each other and where we're from. And this is where, I, you know, in some ways, sport is a great melting pot that you can have locker room conversations and you can joke about things in a certain way if you understand and respect each other. And that's what we want to work towards with our current team. Are we respecting each other to know we can have different views, but when we go to compete, do we have each other's backs? And part of that is talking about real life issues. And uh, that, that's, I just want to learn from it. And it's not, uh, my opinion about what the, maybe my opinion doesn't. <laughs> my perspective, I'm scared now. <laughs> my, this is for method. Right. This is for the <laughs> my perspective, because I'm the head basketball coach, isn't more than the freshman point guard or the sophomore transfer or whatever it is. Basketball, in any sport, represents a large, different set of socioeconomic backgrounds of people. And if we're willing to listen, like I said earlier, intently, we can all learn. And I'm actually excited that some of the conversations we had in the summertime with a couple guys in the locker room, some of the conversations we had with guys um, as early as yesterday, early even today, let's be willing to learn. And if we have that attitude, um, I think we could all be in a better spot. There's no way that I would expect our players to have the same feeling I have during the national anthem because of where I've worked. That's not, it's not fair. It's not even right. I don't even expect that. Does it mean something personally because I've coached guys that have later on deployed and are currently deployed and representing our country? Sure, there's, a, there's an element of pride and maybe respect, but it's not my jobs force that opinion on, hey, if you're going to be here at Drexel, you got to know where I'm from. You can know about it, but I'm not going to make people think that. And, and I think there's a lot of great reasons and understanding that I want to learn about. So I see it as something that, that let's, if we can learn, it can be a unifier more than something 
that divides us. And that's about, in my opinion, passionately listening to what we're about. Thank you for that. Um, Patrick, um, last week you sent me a note, and you, um, you, you, you wanted to um, talk about um, sort of the role of labor unions or lack thereof in terms of this, these kinds of conversations, how they emerge, um, and what, what kind of forms they take. Um, do, you, do you want to talk about that and your thoughts on that? And um, uh, um, Kevin and Zach, um, um, uh, I'd love for you to respond to um, Patrick's thoughts. Sure. Um, before I do that, there's, there's one part of what you were saying I just kind of wanted to add on to, which was the idea of sort of listening to each other. And one thing I think you see, particularly with the Kaepernick protests, but probably going back historically, there's a lot of this too, is you, you see them very quickly become something where people are talking past each other about different things. In the case of Kaepernick, it's very clear. Like, Kaepernick's protest is, a, is about, it comes out of Black Lives Matter, and it's meant to be talked about, you know, unaccountable state violence against minorities over America, essentially. And like a long, shameful history that we have of that, that is ongoing. And what we are doing and not doing about that, and you know, and to the nitty gritty public policy and what we're doing and not doing about that, it's a really complicated conversation. It's a complicated subject, and but he's trying to bring awareness and attention to that, and basically say, you know what, this, we, we got to do something here about this. This is the status quo is not acceptable. Now he's choosing the national anthem, I think, for a particular reason. I, I think for two reasons. I think one because. It's a moment where people are expressing pride in America. And he's saying, this is something we shouldn't be proud about. This is something where we're coming up short as Americans, where our society, all of us, are failing. I think that's the point of choosing that moment for that kind of protest. I also think the other reason that you choose that moment, and this is across the board, think about protests. What's the point of a protest that leaves everybody feeling comfortable? That's not really a protest. That's like sending a strongly worded letter to somebody, right? Like the point of a protest, whether it's sitting at a lunch counter, blocking traffic, um, showing up in mass at the White House or in the mall in where I live in Washington, uh, and giving speeches and demonstrating unity, I mean, demonstrating strength in numbers. Like the point of it is to inconvenience and in some ways upset people, to confront them. That's kind of thing, to actually get people to think about something, to point out something's wrong here, the status quo. <coughs> So it's also understandable that there would be backlash always to this, because people don't like being made uncomfortable. Um, and I do think in the case of, uh, in the, to get back to my point about how people are talking past each other, instead of talking about what Kaepernick is trying to say and the issue is trying to raise, because of the way that he's doing it, people start talking about national anthem, basically decorum and etiquette. That's what the conversation became about. You can't do this. It's, it, I mean, I don't mean to make light of it, but it's pretty similar to like, you cannot use that fork with the salad. You're supposed to use that with the steak. That's almost what we were really fighting about. That's kind of what Trump made it about. Now, obviously, there's a lot of other stuff that's about when Trump got involved. It's definitely racial. And in a lot of ways, it's, it is kind of saying, this isn't a problem at all. Um, black people should speak out about this. You know, but. I do think for at least some portion of the people that were upset by this or sort of pushing back on what Kaepernick was doing, they were just sort of upset about the etiquette of it all and feeling like this isn't an appropriate place to have any kind of protest about anything. And that's where I think you get a lack of listening completely and people talking past each other. Look, there's a lot of people who don't think state violence against minorities either exists as a problem, is a problem that they actually care about, and maybe there's some people that actually are okay with that for various bad reasons. But those people are probably never gonna to listen to Black Lives Matter or Colin Kaepernick or anybody else. But there's a number of people that I think could listen. And I think in some ways if they can, if they can, and I think some of the polling is showing they are starting to, get a little bit past the idea that this is, a, and you talked about framing narratives, that somehow this is about the flag and the military and patriotism and are you proud enough in America and get to the idea of like, what's America doing to its minority citizens and what should it be doing? 
then I think do not listening can happen. Um, I'm sorry, that wasn't about the labor part of this at all. I'd like to get down the though, as we as we get a response to that. Um, um, Kevin, do you have um, thoughts? Uh, sure. Um, I'll just point out that iconic um, photograph right there. I may be the only person in the room who's actually interviewed all three of those people. Um, one of whom is gone now, Peter Norman, the, uh, the white guy, uh, number two, the silver medalist. Um, but I, I just point to that thing about what you were saying about the uncomfortableness of, of protest and also thinking about silence. So um, heading up to the 68 Olympics, Harry Edwards, uh, who, who Patrick mentioned, um, was trying to organize uh, black Olympians um, to boycott the 68 games in uh, Mexico City. And uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, and uh, there was a, there was a, uh, the, the track team, the U.S. track team for the first time had a uh, black coach, um, a guy by the name of Stan Wright, who was an extremely successful um, uh, track coach at, um, I believe, at Texas Southern. Um, at any rate, these meetings are going on, and, and Stan Wright is, the one voice in the room who's standing up and saying, no, you, you guys should not boycott these games. You, you should go to the games. And his point was, you should go to the games because if you stay home, no one is, fewer people are likely to pay attention to what it is you want to protest. If you go to the games, the world will pay attention. Um, and there was a lot of blowback. And, uh, Stan Wright got dismissed as an Uncle Tom, um, as somebody who was just carrying the water for the, uh, for the, US, uh, for the U.S. track and field because uh, uh, he wanted to win medals. Um, but at any rate, in the end, almost all of them went, with the exception of, I think, uh, Lou Alcindor, who would go on to become Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And then you have that, that moment. Um, and although that was a silent moment for those two, for that two and a half minutes, or however long it took to get through the national anthem, um, they were very vocal afterwards and have been for all of their lives about why they did what they what they did. So, to that point, I think you know that just kind of underscores the importance of, of sports as a um, as a platform. Um, because we all pay attention to it, and we absolutely cannot uh, ignore it. Um, it disrupted um, uh, a moment that that we think of as um, solemn. Um, and the other interesting thing about it is that, and this was the interesting thing from Kaepernick, is when you do that, you in, in sports, yes, you're going to alienate some people. You're going to create some enemies among your fans. But the amazing thing is, in sports, is that you can create allies that you never knew you had. And so to me, the most amazing thing about Kaepernick was that in the next, in the couple of weeks after he first um, uh, protested, the hashtag began, Veterans for Kaepernick. And you saw all of these military men and women around the country and around the world saying, this this was this is why we believe we are doing what we're doing, and I don't think anybody thought that they would see that sort of reaction. I have a question for, for the two of you. I mean, everybody we've talked about has been a trailblazer for this topic at one point in time in their current time, and they've always been vilified at that time. Yep. Right. Uh, they're not. They're certainly not celebrated. Right. Mm -hmm. During that time. Can we get to the point, can we evolve to where people can have a different stance and they're not put on an island and, and we can say, hey, respect it, see it, got it. Can, can we get to that point where they're not made and, and I mean, we're, we're in a society right now where everyone's got their phone out right now tweeting, if not, and they're following something that you're, you're a hashtag away from being something popular or trending or whatever it is. You've got a generation that's got an attention span of eight seconds, documented, 
right? Maybe they round it up, right? Uh, the reality is it's about imagery and that. Can we get to a point where people aren't vilified for taking these stances? Well, I would think the only way you, you get to that is if the things that they are standing up for um, are seen as righteous causes by everyone. And generally, if you're standing up for something, that means that that might mean that there's been, you're, yeah, you're standing against something. Right. It's kind of like Arthur Murray, the essayist, I think he wrote one time something about him. Like every every statement is a is a statement against something else. Like if you say you like the sun, that means you don't like cold weather. Um, it's very simplistic, but it, it makes a lot of sense. So. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we can. I don't think ever when someone when someone's protesting the status quo, right? There's a reason it's a status quo in the first place. Is the majority of people are either support it or okay with it, and they're definitely not protesting themselves about it. So I don't think in their in the time of the protest we'll ever see that because like kind of what Kevin's saying, that if, if you do see that, it probably means the thing you're protesting isn't actually controversial or something that needs protesting. Like if I stand right now, like I'm taking a stand for golden retriever puppies, like there's nothing to like really get worked up about there. It's not it's not something we can all be unified and agree about that because there's actually not an issue. Um, I think the good news is that over time, historically, we do seem to move towards what you're talking about in retrospect. You know, social mores change, cultural changes, politics changes. We sort of, at least historically, have moved to a better place over time with many of these issues of social justice, whether you're talking about race, gender, sexual orientation, across the board. So America has haltingly, like with a lot of difficulty, uh, kicking and screaming has sort of dragged itself to be a more inclusive, tolerant, and just place. Um, that doesn't mean we're there at all, but it means we're getting closer to historically. The closer we get, the more I think people can look back retrospectively on moments like in Mexico City and feel unified about it and agree that was a good thing, those people are heroes, what they're standing for is right. Um, but I, I agree with you. In the moment, I don't think we're ever going to get there. And if, and if we were, then we would. If we were ever there, it means we were kind of done having social problems, which is never going to be the case. Well, and Zach, your question really evokes for me one of the motivating factors for doing this program. Um, there, there's this striking image of um, a protest at a football game at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And um, there are, um, the, uh, the, the people are in the stands and they're separated by race um, so that there are black protesters and they're standing with their fists in the air. And then um, either in front of them or behind them are, um, um, white students with their hands across their heart um, as the anthem is being played. And that division, um, you know, that, that, that lack of understanding, that ability to be able to see, the ability to be able to, um, to, to understand pain or hate or whatever it is that's driving this, t to me, as, as people who aspire to be leaders in our respective fields, we need, we need to do our level best to try to figure out how to, to listen, how to bring people together. Um, and, um, and we are clearly in a moment um, of divisiveness right now in a way that we have not seen in decades. Um, and, and I think part, part of the lesson is that we clearly didn't do it right if we had done it right, um, if, we, if, if, if the Jackie Robinson myth was really true, you know, that sport, you know, just miraculously integrated, we would, be, we would not be at the point where we are now, right? So the last question I'm going to ask before we turn to Q&A is um, William Roden, who um, I know the two of you know, um, um, who's um, the um, editor 
um, editor at large um, for the undefeated, ESPN's undefeated, and, and fame um, uh, writer for the New York Times prior to that. He has spoken a number of times about the fact that the framing of our discussion is not correct. And even the framing of our program today is not correct. That, that, that this should not be about a conversation about race and sport, but a conversation about racism and sport. And I wanted to get your reactions to that in terms of the implications of that recognition, that this isn't about race and sport, it's about racism and sport. Um, so I'm going to ask you to opine on that. I also, I, I need to um, let you all know, Zach has another commitment that he has to get to, so he, you've got to be out of here at 610, I know. Um, so I want the audience to know what a great favor you've done, so as you exit, um, I, I, I want to express my appreciation, um, and, and also to, I, I want you all to know why he's leaving, that he's done me the big favor <laughs> in coming. Um, so, um, and, so um, and, and Patrick, you were, you were, kind of, you were applauding, so can we have a round of applause? <laughs> Okay. Is this about racism and sport? Well, and before I answer that, let me just say just two things about something you said. One of the reasons sports is a great platform for protest is because of what you just said. It's the fact that it is one place where people, everybody comes together, right? It is not siloed. It is not an echo chamber. Um, and the other thing is, is the, the other important thing I try and um, uh, uh, drill into my class is that is this myth about sports that despite that, um, we have this myth about sports that it has been in the vanguard of social change in this country. It hasn't. It hasn't. Um, back to what Patrick said, you know, it is a reflection, it is a mirror of society. Um, we've got to remember that, you know, baseball started as an integrated sport. It's segregated under the pressure of the destruction of Reconstruction and the birth of Jim Crow. Every sport follow that example. The National Football League decided in 1933 that it no longer wanted to have the progeny of enslaved Africans in its game. And for 13 seasons, that's the way it behaved. So it's never been in the forefront of these um, movements. Um, but when those movements happen within sports, we all pay attention. Now, back to race and racism. That's critical. And Bill and I talked about that um, before, because to talk about race is much easier than to talk about racism. Because when you talk about racism, there is the understanding that someone is being accused of wrongdoing. Um, and so that's what makes, that's what, that's what's happened to this conversation, is that it started it started as a discussion or a point of view about racism or a racist behavior within this country. And by the way, if you go to the Washington Post, who, which keeps a database on police killings in the country, last I checked, there, are, there were more people who had been killed by police in this country um, uh, a year later. Um, so this isn't a problem that's gone away. And black males are being killed by the police at a, you know, at a two and a half rate uh, greater than everyone else. So it's not a problem that's gone away. So it's much easier for us to talk about race. But it's much more difficult for us to talk about racism because that turns off those who feel that they are being accused of supporting a racist system. I would just add, yeah, I mean, I think we definitely are talking about racism, not just race. Um, and one thing that I think you see in the discussion around Kaepernick and the discussion around what he's talking about, which is, again, the, the state violence against minorities being unaccountable, and the larger political discussions we see around race and racism in America, and even some of the smaller discussions we see in sports that involve race and racism, is there are sort of two definitions or two ideas of like what racism actually is. There's sort of the easy definition of 
And you hear this a lot. People say, uh, hey, they use the word hey. That there's just this hatred in people's hearts. Like, you have a different skin color than me. You're from a different tribe. Like, I just have a visceral disgust and dislike of you. I hate you. Like, I'm going to, I'm, you're not human to me in some way. You're not the same as me. That's a real thing. That's one kind of racism. That's sort of the easy kind of racism to understand. It's not easy to eradicate, but it's also kind of easier to talk about. And it's very easy for, I think in this day and age in America, it's very easy for most people in America to say, well, I don't feel that. And I don't know anybody who really feels that. How is racism even a problem anymore? And there's a second kind of racism, which is sort of the structural racism that we all sort of live in that our society is built on, that our history is made up of, that is still super prevalent across the board, including in sports. Again, sports is a mirror. Sports is not separate from the rest of society. And that kind of racism is all the unconscious biases we carry around. Again, it's the legacy of all the decisions we've made and our ancestors have made in terms of how we structure our society, how we structure who gets what, who gets what rights, you know, who gets redlined in real estate, who doesn't, uh, how do we treat them through our criminal justice system? And you go back to what Kaepernick is protesting. I mean, if you look at the history and the current state of criminal justice system in the United States, it's completely tied up with our history of racism. You look at our drug laws, and it's not, it's not just coming African Americans, it's like basically a lot of our drug laws across the board for different substances, you know, they became draconian when certain racial groups were associated with the use of these substances. If you look at how we're treating opioids, it's completely different than how we treat marijuana or cocaine or, or heroin. And you just have to go back and look at this. And so that's like structural racism. I even talked about this in the context of the NCA. Uh, I've written about how the NCA system and amateurism, you know, the majority of the workforce on the field in revenue sports is African American. The people generating the billions of dollars, 10 billion plus dollars a year of revenue are African American. The vast majority, the vast majority of the people in positions of power, when you're talking about coaches, athletic directors, administrators, across the board, university presidents, they're white. The system the NCAA set up, amateurism, it transfers wealth from one group to the other. That doesn't mean that anyone in that system, that doesn't mean a coach like yourself or anybody, has hate in their heart, that they're racist. In fact, I would be willing to wager almost none of those people do. I've met tons of these people. They're actually really good people. That doesn't mean the system isn't arguably structurally racist. And that's the kind of debate you see across the board. You see with criminal justice. You see with other things in society. And I think it's very hard, still in America, for us to sort of make a distinction between those two types or two strains of racism and to talk about them and to get to your point, too, to talk about them in a non-defensive way, I think this is especially hard for white people in America, to not be instantly de defensive when the term racism is brought up. But I think a lot of the defensiveness comes from the idea of, well, I don't have hate in my heart. How can you say this? I see people standing for the flag being proud of the military. Where are you talking about racism here? And I think until we can kind of get past that, until we can make that distinction, and see how there's so much structural stuff, and there's so much stuff we're still living with because of, in the past, we had a lot more of that first kind of racism. We're not gonna be able to get, move forward like you talked about, and be unified, and be on the same page even when we're talking about. Yeah. That's what I see a lot of people not talking about the same things. Yeah. I, I agree, and I know I have to leave, but one of my questions is, is beyond the protest, what's next? Like the, the, the protest, has been powerful. It has done its job. Like beyond that, I want to tell our guys in the locker room, we can do whatever you want. I'd like to do it together as a team if possible. Don't know that is possible. But beyond that, how are you impacting your community? Right? Because if it's about relationships and connections, what are we what's the next thing we're doing? Right? Past the imagery. You know, that's that's kind of the the sexy headline. What are we doing? Are we are we involved in our community? Are we as Drexel basketball involved in West Philadelphia? Are we serving the community closest to us so that people see a connection? Because I agree with both of you. Sports catches the reason people 
see the protest is because everyone watches sports. Yeah. Right? Well, everyone watches sports. Everyone recognizes those sports figures. And that's something we talk about. We've got a little bit of responsibility to help do the next part, which is connect people not in front of a camera, not on the newspaper, or not for a publicity event. Let's just do the right thing to help people in our area. What does that look like? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, that's the, <clears throat> you know, when you start a protest, there is supposed to be, I guess, some announced. in game. There's an ounce, right? There's, right. there's got to be right. something done, right. not just, hey, we keep protesting. Right. right. What's the. And to, you know, there have been, um, you know, there have been some stories about, you know, I know, I know Kaepernick has met with um, police out on the West Coast in the Bay Area. Um, other athletes have done the same thing. Uh, there have actually been some, some players who have uh, uh, come to Washington, D.C. and um, met with legislators <clears throat> on Capitol Hill uh, about things that can be done. Um, it's, the NFL thing is harder because it's, and I, I hate to harp on it because I feel like I'm picking on Kaepernick, I'm, I'm not, but just, I, I look at that picture and the thing that people forget about that is that um, Carlos and Smith were part of an organization. Um, they were not doing that on, on their own. That was the uh, Olympic Movement for Human Rights, I believe that's what it was called. And if you see, they have a little, look closer at the picture. That's the only piece of sports art that I, I have. Um, and there's a little white circle on their chest. And you can see there's a little white circle on Peter Norman's chest. Boy, um, for that. What's that? By the way, we don't have time to sure. sit down, but read about Peter Norman as well, and what he sort of endured and caught backlash for back in Australia for wearing yeah. one of those pins in solidarity. Yeah, and, uh, and, and that's what that represents, the organization that they were, were a part of. And uh, uh, so, you know, when you're part of an organization, you have a platform, you have goals, um, you have something that's gonna sustain you. Uh, you know, Stokely Carmichael, that was his big thing, would always challenge people, you know, what organization are you in? Who are you working with? You know, that's what he did when he went to the South. He organized people. Um, and, uh, and, and when, you, when you're not organized, it's just, you know, when everything is so fragmented, um, it, it's, it's hard to figure out what those goals are, how you are going to move forward. Um, and it, and, it's, and it's, it's much easier to fall apart. Yeah, and strength especially numbers. in America, is always in numbers. And especially in America, where technically speaking, we still have a functional democracy. I mean, at least probably we do. So that, I think, I think in terms of where do you go or what do you do next, I mean, protests, you know, can be a vehicle for raising awareness. They can also be, it can be a vehicle for, it's, it's a very effective vehicle for organizing as well. Bringing people who agree with your protest together to start to organize, to start to build strength in numbers. I think it works both like all movements, I think it works from the bottom up and from the top down. So from a bottom up level, you know, things when you see athletes going to the local police departments, trying to build bridges in those communities, literally build one-on-one -on -one relationships between people in communities and the police with the athletes sort of acting as in-betweens there. I mean, that can be pretty powerful, it, you know, on, on, a, on a very small, local, but effective basis in terms of if there's something about the way policing is being done that you want to be changed. If you don't want your local police department to act like an occupying army and instead be part of the community, that's a good place to start. But you also need, again, I'm just gonna to stick to the issue that Todd Cameron's talking about. You also need a lot of top-down change. Because again, this is a systemic issue that has a lot of basis in actually the way our law and our courts and the training of our police and how we enforce the laws are all done. And a lot of that comes from the top. It comes from Congress and the laws they make. It comes from the Justice Department, how they enforce those laws. And from that standpoint, what can protesters do? Or what, I mean, it's the, what Obama said. Don't boo, vote. You know, if and, you care about, if you right. care about, like, police departments and how they especially treat African-American communities in structurally racist and discriminatory ways, like, you probably don't want Jeff Sessions as your attorney general. 
he's not going to crack down on that. He's going to ignore what the previous Justice Department found as a problem. That he's not going to care about right. the Senate group. And, and once again, that. that's why I get back to to the strategy. Mm -hmm. um, because as much as I applaud what Colin Kaepernick did, um, you know, it's problematic when you quote Malcolm X um, as a reason for not participating in voting, but you don't read all of Malcolm X when he talked about the power of the ballot <coughs> comparing it to the bullet. And when, um, and when you when you don't take the next step to say, um, okay, I'm making a stance against uh, against deadly, unchecked, deadly police violence against black men, but I'm not going to actively work to stop a campaign whose policing policies come from um, come from a governor of a city who implored policies that were ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court specifically because they targeted black men. So you have, to me, you have to be engaged in that. You can't distance yourself from that. And so, so I, I was troubled by Colin Kaepernick's moderation of his radicalism, which is something that we see happen all the time. I mean, but on this yeah. particular issue, it was I, I, I was, you know, I, I was disappointed. And, and the thing is, that with that top-down work that I'm talking about, like that's slow and hard, and grinding and kind of boring, and it's like very difficult. Like our political system, again, I live in Washington. Like it's designed for gridlock. It's designed in a very <coughs> that was an intentional choice at the founding of this country. Uh, partially for racial reasons, <laughs> it was a intentional choice to make it very slow and not to move very quickly. So you know that you you know the next step from protest beyond that local level is you know getting involved in that long game and that long fight of making those kinds of changes. And again, protest and getting people out on the streets and doing things can push legislation more quickly to happen. It can push the change. It has and it does and it will in the future. <clears throat> But you, like you were saying, you have to have sort of that, those concrete goals in mind. Like, what do I want to get out of this? How do I want, you know, laws do change society. And a lot of times, a law gets put into place, and then things change slowly over time, because you have to fight <coughs> to actually get the laws enacted and to carry out. But they have made a big difference. They do make a big difference. They set the rules of the road, which also makes sense the rules of the road for like, people's attitudes and culture when you look over like generations of people. So that's kind of where, not where it starts, but where you need to go. Like you have, you have to be like a true activist, like you were saying, an activist sort of across, across the whole spectrum, not just the raising awareness spectrum. I think this is a good time to open up for question and answer. Um, we do have a couple of floating mics, but they're going to be floating your way. Um, and uh, I do hope that we have someone brave enough to step up with the first question. Oh, we have many questions. <laughs> Lovely. Um, here's the deal on the questions. Um, and, and we, you know, we started about 10 or 15 minutes late, so, um, so if, um, for those of you who need to leave, please do. But, but if it seems like people want to stay, we're, we're going to keep going for beyond the 6.30 time frame. Um, but and if you can keep your questions to 60, to 60 seconds so that we can get in as many. Um, so I'll let um, uh, the microphone people do their work. How important do you think it is for commissioners like Roger Goodell, Adam Silver, to kind of change the, uh, the culture of protests 
to allow, you know, currently we have the style of protests with like kneeling or they'll wear the I can't breathe shirts. Um, do you think they should just change the culture in, within the leagues to allow maybe more vocal protests, uh, players speaking out more vocally about how they feel about uh, these issues? I mean, I, I, so I'll give you two answers. Like personally, I would love that. Because personally, I, I, I sort of, I think that's a good thing. Um, you have to remember sports commissioners answer, they're not the boss, they answer to the owners of the league, who are the bosses. Owners tend to be extremely focused on what's going to make me money or not make me money. I think a lot of the NFL sort of fumbling, confused response to this can be seen basically through the prism of they're trying to figure out how to make this go away so it doesn't affect their business, essentially. And how do we make this, how do we, but also at the same time, we know that our players care about this and they're our workforce, so if they're overly upset, that will also affect our business. You can, you can kind of see the, I mean like, you're talking about pictures, right? Like, like the Jerry Jones kneeling with all the cowboys on that picture. I mean, you can see that there's a sort of like look of just discomfort and confusion on his face. Um, and the way the cowboys are sort of, he's kind of stumbled around as a different public com comment sense though. I think is very reflective as a whole of these commissioners work for people who primarily have business concerns. So I don't know if your question even makes sense for them because I don't think they see it through that prism. Um, I do think the, the NBA has been a little different than the NFL. I don't think so. I think, that's, I think that's a misperception. Um, be, well, because when the Minnesota <laughs> Lynx um, came out and decided that they weren't going to talk to the media about anything other than uh, Castile and Tamir Rice, um, the NBA tried to crack down on them. Tried to find them. They tried to find them, and they did find them. Then they backed off after after the yeah after, after the press, and then uh, Adam Silver has come out and echoed um, echoed Roger Goodell by saying he expects his players to stand respectfully for the national anthem. My answer to that question is is that. Um, uh, w the, the danger with that is, is that uh, that's when co-optation becomes an issue. And that's what you saw happen with Jerry Jones. So that particular weekend, uh, NFL players have their man who challenged by Donald Trump, um, who, who refers to their mothers as bitches. And uh, they decide, um, many of them, not most of them, that they're going to make a stand. And they do so uh, with their owners. Um, which was a horrible idea. The only reason the owners were there was because Donald Trump also threatened their bottom line when he said he wanted fans to turn off the NFL unless the NFL disciplined these players who were protesting during the national anthem. So um, as if I were advising the commissioners, I would advise them to do nothing. If I'm advising the players, I would advise them to uh, not to not have a care in the world about what it is the commissioners do. Because if you're protesting, you are protesting. You're not concerned about what the backlash is, right? You, the, the, the issue is what gives you backbone. Otherwise, you're asking the, that's like asking them, is it okay if we do this? Oh, you can do this protest. Right, then it's not a protest. And that's what Jerry Jones did. Jerry Jones is brilliant. I've known this guy ever since he bought the Cowboys. So what he did was he, he, he co-opted the entire thing. Because when did he have, what did he do? Anybody remember? Knelt before the anthem. Knelt before the anthem. We're all good now. <laughs> no, we're not. So um, yeah, if I'm if I'm the players, I'm I'm paying no attention to um, uh, to what the what the uh, what the commissioners say. Not only that, you got a, you got a collective bargaining agreement talking about labor. Um, all these things have to be negotiated in there. Um, uh, you know, if you're going to have something like that, um, uh, I, yeah, I would completely ignore. We've been waiting for Ivan, so I think it's time to hear from you. Great, thank you. Uh, so I apologize for the, my tardiness. Uh, to answer your question, I agree with my uh, contemporaries here that um, you know the, the commissioner of any league uh, works for the owners. He doesn't make rules; he enforces the rules. At least in the NFL, in our league is a little different. In the football league, we've got an arbitration process, and our commissioner is not the judge, jury, and executioner. 
in our league. And I was adamant about the last collective bargaining agreement. And we'll probably strengthen that because our agreement ended recently. We're in the midst of a negotiation for the new collective bargaining agreement. Um, I would agree that I think that what Jerry Jones did was frankly laughable. Um, that's just my personal take on it. I come from the business side. I used to be a long time conservative, so I can speak freely on both sides of the issue. Um, I started this job about five years ago representing these players, and I've learned a lot about diversity and really the power base and the struggle that's going on because it is a struggle, as the great Dr. Harry Edwards said last year in this same building. Um, you know, it's called a struggle. And, you know, there's no playbook for protest. So I know a lot of people, you know, have a lot of opinions on protest. Um, I'm a former Marine. I was in the Marine Corps from 90 to 94. I served in the first Gulf War. So when Kaepernick took a knee, that when he sat down on the bench initially, um, it affected me a certain way. But I also looked at it differently in that um, we're talking about liberty. And we're talking about freedom of speech. And I think that what you know the owners have done through uh, assistance with the, the political structure, um, they've, they've certainly take advantage of an opportunity to try to ex exercise some authority and gain some sort of toehold on this social issue that's running around out there with regards to the social injustice of people that are minorities or African Americans or myself, like I'm a Latino, I'm a first generation American, my father's from Costa Rica, my mother's from the Ukraine, um, you know, they came here, they didn't speak any English. Um, but I think that, you know, the right way to solve the problem is I don't think there's one solution. As a veteran, um, when Ka Colin Kaepernick took a knee, I really wasn't offended by that. And I had a lot of conversations with a lot of other Marines. Um, that I'm familiar with, and personally for me, I wasn't offended a bit. Uh, you know, I put a, a memo out. For me personally, I think it was the highest honor you can levy in this country is exercising your liberty, especially in peaceful protest. Uh, I think that this matter probably is going to be raised in collective bargaining agreements and what it looks like in the future. But I think what it stems from is the money. It's you know, most of the, most of the owners are reacting to you know their business, and if the business is losing or if they feel there's, there's a fear there, so it's either the green money or the fear that drives the owners typically. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's enough input from the players to the owners. I think if the owners truly were engaged, if the commissioner was truly engaged with the players, there would be at least a quasi playbook for some of these things because they have a rule for every single other thing that they're trying to accomplish um, you know, in the NFL, as is, 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 is in our league. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, I think it's, um, I don't think it's ever going to be the commissioner's job to try to figure that out. I think it'll be the player's job to try to figure that out collectively with the ownership groups in a way that, like I said, there isn't a playbook in this struggle and in protest, like Kevin said, when you have a protest, you know, it's like running point in, the, in you know, in your unit. And if you're in, you know, if you're in the bush and you're running point, well, there's not a playbook on how to run point. You train well, but the protest is like what Colin did was like running point. You know, and you get a chance to get your butt shot off when you run point. And it takes a brave soul to do that. And you know, someone had to do it. And I, I think that um, you know, the example I would make with what Colin did, um, you know, women for years didn't have the right to vote. And if we just flip the switch and say the field was full of women and the national anthem was playing, and the women took a knee and raised their fist. How does that make people feel? Does it make them feel like you know that women want the right to vote or just equality uh, in the workplace? Does that make people feel like veterans are you know disgraced? In my personal opinion, there is no higher honor for a veteran. Speaking for myself, I can't speak for all veterans. There's no higher honor than defending liberty. When you sign up, you sign up contrary to what some people in D.C. have said. You know, you all know what you sign up for, but know what you sign up for is to defend the Constitution. And if you're familiar with the Constitution, the number one thing that my grandparents came over to Brazil on a boat on my mom's side. They lived in a 15 by 15 shack with a tin roof and a dirt floor that my mom used to sweep and my aunts used to sweep until they came to the States or the church. What people come to this country for is because of the liberties that this country that we enjoy as Americans, the freedoms we enjoy. So albeit a bit uncomfortable to see someone exercising their liberties, Especially when it's peaceful, I don't really have that much of a problem with it. Um, I think that is probably the highest honor you can pay for any veteran that served, myself, those that have perished and given the ultimate sacrifice to their parents, their families. The best thing we can do is honor them by defending that liberty, even though it makes us uncomfortable. 
And I think the owners are a little bit uncomfortable because they felt they were losing a little bit of their power and control with their players. And you know, I hope I see more players gather. There's probably going to be some type of system I would imagine in place in the future where um, you know owners and players can come together. You know, players are not dumb. They're not dumb jocks. They're smart. A lot of them are extremely smart. They've got advanced degrees. A lot of them. Um, there's a solution there, I think, that can make sense. I don't know exactly what it is, but I think it'll probably be something we see in the next collective bargaining agreement come up, um, and I hope the players stick together um, like they have been doing in a way that can expand that dynamic for all the sports, because I think it's a symbol for the world to see and admire the liberty that we have and to be able to like push that forward. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Carter, Carter Kaplan, Drexel University. So with all the backlash that's coming from the Kaepernick, I really don't see much going on with the flag being horizontal. From what I've been told, the flag should only be horizontal when you're burying a soldier, and there's been no talks about why the flag is being horizontal on a field. What are your takes on that? Can I jump in for a second? Go ahead. Um, I'm just a step back and offer a broader observation, and I'm sure you, both of you have seen us too. Or many of you have gone to sporting events in your life or in the course of your life have seen us um, in the course of my career. And even for recreation, I've been to many games. And during the national anthem, uh, this may be a news flash to, to our president. Not everyone is standing at attention being particularly respectful or full of pride. People are in the bathroom line, they're getting pretzels or gabbing beers, they're sitting there texting on their phones. Like, my point is, if you step back and think about it, it's a little weird that we chose sporting events in the first place to be have this moment of, at least what we're claiming to be, this solid remembrance of people who have fallen in the line of duty, serving our country, uh, and active duty personnel. Uh, if you go back and look at the history of it, there's reasons that sports sort of chose to do this and sort of wrap themselves in the flag. Um, some of those reasons are commercial, believe it or not. They're not necessarily that patriotic. And even more recently, uh, we've seen the NFL, for instance, taking uh, quite a bit of money from the Pentagon to wrap itself in the flag. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not necessarily, again, if you look at the history, this pure sort of moment, this organic thing that just sprung up around sports. So I'm not sure that the actual etiquette of how the flag is supposed to be treated is the real issue here. I know I said that it is earlier, but I do think a lot of it is people are pushing back at the actual thing Kaepernick's talking about because they don't like it. They don't want to hear about it. Um, and I get into pushing back because it's also happening during sports where they don't like it. And they're pushing back because it's happening during this moment. That, that has become, <coughs> for many people, a, 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 you know, a legitimate moment of honoring, remembering, taking pride in the military or the flag or both. What do you think, Kevin? Uh, no, I mean, I, I agree. Um, but I also, and I think that kind of underscores what this is all about. It's not about, it's not about any etiquette. And when you understand how sports have been um, uh, how sports have been married to patriotism and most specifically militarism over the years. That's the, the Star Spangled Banner was introduced to sports at the 1918 um, uh, World Series um, because uh, by Woodrow Wilson, um, in part to support the war effort in World War I. And, uh, uh, it caught on, and in 1933 it became, uh, though to much debate, because a lot of people did not like the war imagery of the, um, uh, the Star Spangled Banner, and then it became the national anthem. And it's been in sports ever since. So, I, yeah, so I don't, you know, the, the, that just proves that it's, that's not the issue. And Tom, this, the, Woodrow Wilson, coincidentally, one of our most racist presidents, but also, um, if you go back and look, like, really, like, with terms of what he did with the federal government. Um, but also, the Star Singles Banner itself, I don't know how many of you here are familiar with the third verse and the story about that. If you are, go look that up. Um, even the Star Spangled Banner, like everything in America, is completely wrapped up in racism. And so in some ways, there is kind of a, 
a fitting irony that this is also a moment and a thing that Colin Kaepernick chose to be sort of the stage for his specific protests and the specific issues he is protesting about. Yeah, I agree with Patrick and Kevin. I think that, um, and it's funny because you mentioned, you know, I've been to a lot of interscholastic events and professional events, and um, being a veteran, I tend to observe and see what's going on during the national anthem. And for years, I've watched people not participating in what would be the standard etiquette with respect to the flag and the anthem. As just yesterday, I was going to rehab. I had surgery a month ago on my left knee. And um, I was going to rehab yesterday morning. And up on the hill near where I go to rehab is like this fitness um, group that gets together. Well, there was a school of kids up there with them. And as I'm walking into the facility yesterday morning, they tell the kids to stand and place your hand over your heart and the national anthem's playing. So of course I stopped and I faced the flag, put my hand over my, you know, my heart, did the right thing that I felt you know, I, I should do at that moment. And I looked around and there were people just scurrying about and a, many were coming out of the rehab building, stopped and looked and kind of knew what was going on and dismissed it almost like, well, I'm busy, I gotta go. So I think that it's more symbolism and I think it's there to create revenue. I think it's there to get Americans tied in to the sport in a way that they can rather than just only be in the sport. Um, and I think for years, you know, they've been paid, you know, to commercialize, you know, that symbolism. Uh, I think that um, it pains me when I see people during the anthem and uh, a flag raising um, not at least observing the, you know, the basic principles that we should when that's going on. Although I respect it because I respect liberty and I understand people have the right to choose. Um, but what really infuriates me is when I hear people that are in power that have an opportunity to lead, that have opportunity to make a difference, to have an opportunity to bring our nation together with, you know, different views and thoughts on the process with regards to what's going on. Instead, they, you know, bemoan it. Uh, they turn it into a political punchline. Um, when really, in many of the events, you can look at it, and there's a lot of people that are not, they have no reason not to be standing facing the flag with the hand over their heart. They don't have any issue they're protesting. And they might be mad that the beer is $12. I don't know. Like, but, you know, there's not really a real reason that I see people protesting and not respecting the flag. I think the issue is that when you take a young African American who chose to run point um, on a sensitive issue, on a platform that he enjoys that we don't, uh, have professional athletes have a platform we don't have, whether we like it or not, they've got that. Um, and I think the, when the owners saw that happen, they didn't like it and it didn't have anything to do with um, their personal views. It had to do with their pocketbook and really it boils down to power and control over the players. The NFL has historically been a power and control uh, sport. The owners have long held a lot of sway and power over the athletes, although it's changed through collective bargaining. It's still, you know, if you just look at the collective bargaining agreement that the NFL players have, it's one of the weakest agreements, although there's a lot of money in it. It's one of the weakest agreements. You comparatively look at the NBA or you look at baseball. Um, hopefully that's changing. You know, I don't, I don't believe for a minute that the owners that got the players together recently and talked about these issues were actually that serious about it. Uh, I'll wait for the rest of the story to be told and see what they're actually gonna do. You know, what, you know, what actions are they gonna take? Are they gonna come together? And are they gonna find out what their process is with respect to the anthem and the flag? And are the players gonna be able to have a period of time maybe that they will be able to use their platform? Because in my opinion, I think what Jerry Jones said about um, any player that doesn't stand for the anthem that you know takes near is going to be benched. Well, you know there's the carrot and the stick, and you know as we grow and evolve, you can use negative reinforcement all day long. And I think there's plenty of sociologists and doctorates that will tell you that you know using negative reinforcement is not the best way to do it. Maybe a better way to do it would have been for the for Jerry Jones to incentivize his players in some manner. And I don't mean money. I mean incentivize players and give them choices to choose from on how to exercise maybe their rights in a way that, you know, collectively uh, they can move the ball forward in a way that people can respect and grow. I think you can grow from that. So with respect to the etiquette, I think that the flag is there. Uh, it shouldn't be flat 
as you as you stated, that's not the proper way to unfurl the flag. Um, there's no casket down there. Um, but I think that most of what you're seeing is it's the commercialization of patriotism and using sport as a venue because I've always long felt, I got started five years ago, um, I got involved, and I've always felt that sports has long impacted our society and in the world in a great way. There isn't an issue that professional athletes and professional sports can't move the needle on, whether it be a political issue, when you talk about music, you talk about fashion, you talk about social issues. I mean, sports is where a lot of that change happens. And I think that, you know, what many of the leagues are doing is commercializing that patriotism for money. And they don't want anybody messing with that. Can, can I hop in really quick? Um, like, for a second? Um, for a second, we, okay. we'll take one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Just something you said about owner player power. That's something else for all of you to think about. The power dynamic at play, who the owners are, who the players are. And again, as sports is a mirror of society, how does that reflect the power dynamics and the racial dynamics of our society? I think that's something else to consider about what's going on with these protests and how they play.